Funding for this program was provided in part by the Division of Continuing Education at Brigham Young University. Welcome to another roundtable discussion of our continuing series in the Doctrine and Covenants. We have together, together today gathered a group of professors from the Department of Church History and Doctrine at Brigham Young University. Seated directly opposite from me is Richard Cowan, a professor of Church History and Doctrine. Thank Great you for being here. here. Thanks, Richard. We also have Randy Bott, another professor from Church History and Doctrine. It's good to have you, Randy. It's good to be here, Matt. And Stephen Harper. It's nice to have you here, Stephen. Thank you, Matt. And my name is Matthew Richardson. I'm Associate Dean of Religious Education. Today we're going to uh, pick up sections 41 and 42. Um, great sections. Um, I'm hoping we can get through so much material. It's uh, one of those types of where it's hard to say, well, what should we not cover and what should be covered? Because this turns out to be the backbone for the foundational elements of Zion. Richard, why don't you give us a quick background and orient us to what's happening here as, uh, before we jump into the text in 41 and 42. In sections uh, 37 and 38, the Lord directed the saints to move to Ohio, which now they are doing. They're arriving. He had also promised that he would reveal his law. And now that the saints are uh, in Ohio, there's a question already. They're anxious to get that law. And that's the immediate background of section 41 and is fulfilled in section 42. None of my mention the word, the beginning of 1831, which is the most productive year in terms of sections now in the Doctrine and Covenants. So just at the beginning of a rich season of revelation. That's a good point. In section 41, there's a little statement here in the heading that I've always enjoyed. It says here, the members were striving to do the will of God. Now, now here's the statement. So far as they knew it though some strange notions and false spirits had crept in among them. It's almost this notion of counterproductivity of, of establishing the cause of Zion. But, but, but I think that it's important to at least recognize the hearts of the saints is they were tr striving to do the will of God so far as they knew it, but yet they weren't beyond asking, what else must I do? Which is exactly. where section 42 comes in so nicely. But I think what Richard brought up, uh, that they were anxious. Let's get on with the law. Yeah. Let's get it. The Lord says, okay, but let me just warn you, like in verse 1 of section 41, he says, I delight to bless you with the greatest of all blessings, ye that hear me. Ye that hear me not will I curse that have professed my name with the heaviest of all cursings. So there's a weight associated. There's a great blessing if we are given the commandments and keep them. But there's also some culpability there if we say we'll accept them and then don't. By giving revelation, the Lord locates agency. He puts agency in a person. He empowers us to act. And the revelation is what is to be acted upon. And we're either blessed for compliance of our own free will or curse for disobedience. And we have that notion of acting. We see this section starts off again with that familiar word, hearken, the, not just enough to listen, but it's listen attent, uh, you know, attentively, but then to, to do. And we see in verse 3, and by the prayer of your faith ye shall receive my law. Why? So that, or that ye may know how to govern my church and have all things right before me. That's, that's an, okay, you're going to get the information. Now I want you to use it to act and to govern in our, in our affairs. In fact, he actually defines discipleship based upon our relationship to the law. One of the best definitions, I the, think. One of the best. In verse 5, he says, He that receiveth my law and doeth it, the same is my disciple. And he that receiveth it and doeth it not, or at least he saith that he receiveth it and doeth it not, the same is not my disciple, and shall be cast out from among you. Reminds me of the Sermon on the Mount. The house built on the sand versus the house built on the rock. Those who hear and obey are certainly distinguished from those who hear and don't obey. That's a good point. 
We, we see the expanding then of, of the church within the Ohio, and, and it's, it's, as Richard was mentioning, a very fruitful time um, in revelatory means, but also in members coming to the church, this desire to become part of this notion of discipleship. And, and with that, we see an interesting, interesting introduction in verse 9 of Edward Partridge and, and what's happening with him of being called to be a bishop within the church. Well, we've met Edward Partridge before. He was one of these early Ohio converts who came to visit the prophet in New York. Uh, he's obviously a devoted follower, a disciple. He has demonstrated his willingness to heed or hearken, I like that word very much, the call. And here the Lord says he wants him to be a bishop, appointed by the voice of the church in verse 9, and ordained a bishop unto the church. Now, in the context of the 1830s, by a bishop, we mean someone who spends his time in the labors of the church looking after the material resources of the church, an agent for the Lord. There's no, um, there's no uh, ward uh, stewardship for a bishop in, in the 1830s. Wards are yet to develop in that, right. that notion of a bishop. Notice in verse 9 the distinct steps in his being called. He was called by revelation. I remember President J. Reuben Clark used to call this the electing, or excuse me, the nominating function. Right. And then he would be sustained by the voice of the church, which President Clark called the electing phase, and then uh, ordained, or in some cases set apart, by those in authority. And all of these steps are essential when we are given the opportunity in sacrament meeting, for example, or in general conference to sustain those who have been called. Uh, it's a real thing that uh, this is a part of the process that we are, as earlier revelations pointed out, to seek uh, faith and by the power of faith seek inspiration so that we can know uh, to sustain and then sustain with all our hearts. So when we are called upon to vote for people, I think we can realize it isn't a pro forma thing. It's not a rubber stamp. It's something very meaningful in which we are witnessing that we wish to become part of this process. Or as President Clark also said, he called it a matter of last gravity. It's, it's a weighty experience, this mm -hmm. sustaining. And, and we can see here Edward Partridge, Bishop Partridge is going to need the sustaining of the saints. I think he really yes. is. It's not like you can go and ask and say, so uh, what did you do as bishop or what am I supposed <laughs> to do? This is the first bishop of the church. But one of the things I really like about this section um, is not only as Randy was mentioning is the weight of responsibility that I'm sure he feels. But we also hear from the, the Lord's lip um, an introduction of what type of person Edward is. He's, I'll have to admit, he's one of my favorites, and I've never met him. But look at verse 11. And this is because his heart is pure before me, for he is like unto Nathaniel of old, in whom there is no guile. What a, what a nice individual to be having help us in this stewardship of being able to come towards Zion. I think uh, it's significant. He's got these two characteristics, evidently. He's pure in heart. He's like Nathaniel of old, and he's clearly a pretty good merchandiser. He, he's good at managing a business and the affairs of a business. And it seems to me that in our presiding bishops, we've, got, we've always got this combination of factors, pure souls, uh, Nathaniel of old types, and yet very capable, talented uh, stewards of the Lord's temporal affairs. Well, one more just interesting point before we move on to section 42 is that it was only just two months prior to this that uh, section 36 was given to Edward Partridge, and now he's brand new in the church, <laughs> and sometimes we get overwhelmed at the fact that we don't feel quite ready for a calling, and I wonder how Edward Partridge felt. You know, there he didn't have any preparation. Maybe this is where President Monson's oft-repeated couplet goes, that whom God calls, he qualifies. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Well, let's look at section 42. Here comes the law of the church, as the saints often refer to it. Um, one of my favorite uh, statements, just to, to, to lay as a foundation, comes from Joseph Fielding Smith, where when he talked about this, he said, this section was given for the establishment of the city of Zion. It's, it's almost like um, th this isn't the blueprints of laying out the physical city as much as it is. Here are the blueprints for the hearts of the inhabitants of Zion. 
line, which become very key here. And there are so many things here in this section that are worthy of reading, almost worthy of memorizing. But yet in that context of discipleship and establishing Zion, we see a notion where it almost lineates, this is how Christ works. Here's how Christ um, uses, would use the law or the scriptures. Here's how Christ would teach. Here's the compassionate service of Christ. Wonderful sections as, as we go through this notion of, of, uh, of the law. Let's look at verse 2 to start off with. And again, I say unto you, hearken and hear and obey the law which I shall give unto you. There's that notion of discipleship. Receive, and I'm expecting you to do here. It's re really great as far as that would be. Well, let's, let's, let's just jump through and do the best that we can as, as we uh, work through section 42. What, what uh, jumps out to you to start off with in this wonderful section, but with so many things? I, I, I must be the missionary prep person here because <laughs> the first thing that jumps out at me is that, uh, that we're to go forth in verse 6, preaching my gospel two by two, declaring my uh, word as likened to the angels of God. You know, and uh, here he's saying, go on out there. I, 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 you're my earthly angels. You better go out and just spread my word to the people there. And he even says, you're going to go out and cry repentance to these people and, and you're going to get them gathered together in this same gathering idea that we've, we faced here. And so he's really focusing on how this gospel is to be spread from this small congregation here to the vast ends of the earth. Good point. Good point. We also see in this notion of the no, preaching the gospel, uh, let me go down into verse 11, and I say unto you that it shall not be given to anyone to go forth to preach my gospel or to build up my church, here's a big word, except he be ordained by someone who has authority and is known to the church. We see the notion of common consent coming through the sustaining again. But also the principle here underlying, girding this up is the concept of stewardship again, is stay within your stewardship and, and, and let's talk of stewardships. And then we get into the notion of, of Christ-like teaching or how one would, would teach. So properly appointed uh, authorities or teachers are to go and they're to teach only specific things laid out in 12. The elders, priests, and teachers of the church shall teach the principles of my gospel, which are in the Bible, the Book of Mormon, in the which is the fullness of the gospel. And then how to do that. And this is the part that is particularly challenging uh, as a teacher. Maybe you share my feeling of these verses of 13 and 14. They shall observe the covenants and church articles to do them. This means that the early missionaries are supposed to be very carefully um, following what's laid out in section 20 and 22, especially about how to baptize, who meets the qualifications for baptism, how do we administer the sacrament, how do we serve in the church and those things. And then 14, and the spirit shall be given to you by the prayer of faith. And if you receive not the spirit, ye shall not teach. You know, I think, I can't help but think of uh, um, some of the studies I've been doing of late um, in teaching in and of itself. Uh, Parker Palmer, who is a, a noted pedagogue, talks about a phrase as teaching mirrors the soul. And, and I see that in verses 13 and 14 is we might say the words, but it's very difficult to counterfeit the soul of the teacher. Now that's not saying one must be perfect, of course, but it's saying in the notion is observing the covenant, striving with the honest heart. It is, and there, these are checks and balances put on the Lord's teachers. And maybe you feel as I do that in, in as being a, an educator, especially of, of scripture or church history, you have an enormous authority. People expect that you're credible. And it's, just, it's a heavy burden to try to always teach the truth in, in love. And these checks and balances will make us, make, will keep us in the right way if we are properly authorized to do so, if we teach the principles of the gospel as we find them in the Holy Scriptures, and if we do all of that by the Holy Spirit. And if we use those guides and checks, we'll be okay. And then you shall teach. In verse 14, I think that there's maybe more implied there where it says, if you don't have the Spirit, you shall not teach. Meaning you're not going to teach with the Spirit, perhaps, but maybe you shouldn't teach at all. <laughs> you, know, you know, if you don't, well, don't you'll don't do a lot you of teach. things. You well, can entertain, you can instruct, you can exhort, but the teaching changes people's lives. And so the word that you speak as a teacher, unless punctuated by the Spirit does not motivate the listener to change their lives, and therefore the teaching does not take place. It's frightening yeah. to imagine teaching without the Spirit. <laughs> you know, sometimes when you read that, you shall not teach. You wonder, is that uh, prescriptive? In other words, you're not supposed to teach? Or descriptive, <laughs> you cannot teach. And I think it's probably both. Yeah, that's a good point. 
One of the things that I think is a nice segment here, and, and I, I like the way the conversation is going, I'm learning a lot here, is in 13 and 14, the notion of having the Spirit and observing the covenants. Then you have this nice segue where we go into a next section here of almost the moral conduct, a reminder of those who want to live the will. Here's some reminders. And so starting in verse 18, we see some of the basics, thou shalt not kill. Um, and, and we go through some of these wonderful elements of moral conduct all the way through, I guess you could go to 29 or, or even extend it farther. But it seems it's a nice segue is they shall observe the covenants and the church articles to do them. And by the way, here's a reminder. Let's look at some of the basic moral um, uh, standards for disciples. And something that's impressed me is that the Lord <clears throat> gave the ancient Israelites the Ten Commandments when they were about to establish new homes in the Promised Land, you know, establish a new uh, society, a new people. And now here these people are uh, beginning to establish new homes in Ohio, and He reviews many of the Ten Commandments. And later in the Doctrine and Covenants, when uh, a group is about to establish themselves in Missouri in section 59, we get the same thing, a review of some of these basic principles that will govern what kind of a people they need to be. I kind of remind you of Alma chapter 5, remember, remember, you know this notion yes. of don't forget, yes. let's remember, remember. The Lord also gives those early Israelites His, his law or, or consecration in Deuteronomy, and this same discussion culminates in consecration as well, beginning in verse 29. You know, the thought just crossed my mind as we were talking about the very first. He says, I, I'm going to give you these commandments, and if you keep them, I'll bless you with the richest of all blessings. If you don't, the heaviest of all cursings. And when we talk about, in verse 18, about killing, he said, And now, behold, I speak unto the church. Thou shalt not kill, and he that killeth shall not have forgiveness in this world nor in the world to come. He doesn't necessarily say that about the people of the world as much as he does about the fact when you take upon my name, uh, and become a member of my church, uh, then, and your conduct drops down to that low level, you're in trouble. Yeah. And so that we follow up with some others, thou shalt not lie in 21. Here's an interesting one in 22 and 23. Um, thou shalt love thy wife with all thy heart. To my understanding, that's the only other time, or the only time in scriptures that we're commanded to love something with our heart other than the Lord himself. And that's an interesting concept there, and cleaving unto her and none else. And then here's an interesting parallel, especially for our day. He that looketh upon a woman to lust after her, and I can't help but think of the problems we're having with immorality to pornography, etc. But look at these outcomes here. Lust shall deny the faith and shall not have the spirit, and if he repents not, he shall be cast out. What an interesting corrosive element there of the notion of lust is denying our faith and, and then not having the spirit and uh, well, well there, there's another really interesting parallel which he refers back to this in section 63 and verse 16 where he said and verily I say unto you as I have said before back in 42 that he that looketh upon uh, on a woman to lust after her or if any commit adultery in their hearts three inescapable consequences number one they shall not have the spirit Number two, they shall deny the faith. And number three, they shall fear. And it's interesting. So therefore, it's consecrate thyself. Um, give me of your full heart. Once again, we see that. Now, Steve, you brought up the principles of, uh, which is a great segue, is the next little segment there is speaking of really a principle of consecration. We, we, we see the practices of what we call consecration and stewardship, those laws, uh, a little bit later, which would be discussed in future sections. But boy, it's interesting the principles laid down of consecration here. He does lay down the principles, and they're so clear and succinct. Brigham Young said it's the clearest revelation uh, you can imagine. It's that we, I think, want to confuse it uh, to cover our guilt, uh, <laughs> to let us, as Elder Maxwell sometimes says, play act a little longer <laughs> rather than walking up to the revelation. But look at these commandments. They're quite clear about what we're to do, how we're to manage our material resources, beginning in verse 30. Thou wilt remember the poor and consecrate of thy properties for their support. I like to remind my students because it's all too easy for us to think of ourselves as so generous with the poor, that we're the poor. And especially those of us who work or attend BYU, boy, a hugely disproportional share of, of the Lord's resources are invested in us. And we're the beneficiaries of other people's consecration. And the only way to justify that in my mind is for us to become investments, to belong to the church in the most literal sense, to give all we can. Consecrate of their properties, thy properties for their support, that which thou hast to impart unto them, 
and then to 31, inasmuch as ye impart of your substance to the poor, you will do it unto me, and you lay your surplus property before the bishop of the church or his counselors, uh, or those appointed to serve with him. And let's skip down to 55 for purposes of this discussion. So succinct here, a clear statement of the law of consecration, at least in this dimension. If thou obtainest more than that which would be for thy support, thou shalt give it into my storehouse. That's really quite simple. And there's no reason that that can't be lived today. President Romney's been clear on that point. President Hinckley has said that the law of consecration is still very much with us. Yeah, it's very difficult. I, no reason we shouldn't live it today, but there's a difficulty here is the notion of knowing that which is sufficient for our needs. Right. That seems to be a base principle here that the Lord is almost teaching a characteristic trait. For, for example, the last line of verse 32 in section 42 says, as much as is sufficient for himself and his family. And the question is, what's what is that? sufficient? Yeah. And we're living in a time where there's so much harvest and, and, and the bounty is rich. Is What is sufficient? What is a need versus a want? And there's a characteristic here that the Lord seems to be teaching of the inhabitants of Zion. And there's so, um, there's an awful lot of latitude. The Lord seems loath to get uh, mosaic, if I could use that word on us here. Look at verse 33, though. It gives us at least an, an adverb uh, right at the bottom. Well, let's start right at the top. Again, if there be properties in the hands of the church or individuals in it, more than necessary for their support after they've already made their first donation of surplus, which is a residue, to be consecrated to the bishop, it shall be kept to administer to those who have not from time to time, so that everybody can receive according to their needs. Now, notice that amply supplied. Isn't that telling? Mm -hmm. The Lord uh, has created enough and to spare. Everyone can be amply supplied. Far from being a vow of poverty, the law of consecration is the answer to the world's economic problems. It is the Lord's law of wealth. Yeah. It is. You know, and if we do it His way, and, and we'll find this in, in subsequent sections, that he says, I deign to make you rich in yes. 38. You know, and, and he isn't just talking a land of milk and honey. He's not just talking of the celestial kingdom. He's really talking about here on this earth. But it's got to be done in his own way. You know, in his own way, it becomes clear, is to humble the rich and the poor, and all in the same purpose. All, uh, taking the wealth of those who are willing to consecrate their surplus, Blessing with that same wealth, the poor. Think of the perpetual education fund in this context. What a marvelous manifestation of the spirit of consecration that is. And it will change the world. Yeah, and changing the world. And, and look in verse 35, for the purpose is the building up of the new Jerusalem. I mean, ev everyone benefits of this great um, uh, rolling forth of Zion. And here, here's an interesting thought in verse 36, which especially we, we are seeing this, is when you talk about the new Jerusalem and Zion, almost without a breath, verse 36, and my covenant people may be gathered in one in that day when I shall come to my temple. There's the mentioning of a temple, that you'll find temple and covenant with the consecrated effort of saints. Zion, New Jerusalem, temple are almost synonyms. That's right. That's right. It's the law, wonderful. The endowment, the power, yeah. the temple. Very yeah. much connected. What well, wonderful principles here, and then we see the practice thereof. As a matter of fact, that brings us to another section here that just comes right on its heels, is the uh, the consecrative effort, being able to have that as part of our heart, the inherit celestial traits, perhaps. And then you start to see this notion of compassionate service in 43, um, all the way down into 52, of, of, of helping others in love, weeping for the, in verse 45, weeping for the loss of them that die. There's... These are characteristic and traits of, of um, the Savior, and it's we embody them. Matt, you missed the most important part. Look at verse 45. The, here's the commandment. Thou shalt live together in love. Now, if it was not possible to do that as husband and wife and as parents and children, then the Lord wouldn't put it in here. And yet, uh, President Hinckley and the other brethren have talked so repeatedly about the monster of abuse and, uh, and spousal cr cruelty and the put down of each other. And, and yet, the Lord, in his very law that established the foundation for his people, like we've already talked, was the command to live together in love. You know, and, and that requires a lot of faith. As a matter of fact, look at look down in, we start to see in 48 on, but, you know, often we talk about he who hath eyes, let him, you know, see, and hath ears, let him hear. Look at verse 49. He who hath faith to see shall see. He who hath faith to hear shall hear, and he who hath faith to leap shall leap. There's an interesting principle there that is coming forth to believe in him and have these really become effectual in our lives, the, the principles of Zion. 
It's, it's great. Let's make a point about um, property here. Uh, there has been, especially in the past, some confusion of property ownership and consecration. Is consecration akin to communism and so forth? Notice, though, the way the Lord um, sets that forth. And I think especially in 32. And notice how the connection between agency, accountability, and stewardship and right here at the bottom, agreeable to the commandments. I'm about two-thirds of the way through 32. Every man shall be made accountable unto me, a steward over his own property, or that which he's received by consecration, as much as is sufficient. So consecration uh, functions very much on the principle of stewardship. We and receive our own property. Responsibility. And mm -hmm. think of the manifestations of stewardship in the church today. Uh, priesthood interviews. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're accountable for the uh, callings that we have. We're accountable for our families and so on. That's a good point. Let's, uh, we're running out of time. Let's take a look at some other things here, just briefly touch upon a few points. Um, for example, I think it's interesting you start to see the scripture use in verses 56 through 61 and 59. There's a last line there that says, You've been given the scriptures for a law to be my law to govern my church. What, a, what an interesting foundation. And, and, and it helps us to understand the mysteries in building the New Jerusalem. Uh, for me, I just, 61 is an electric uh, opportunity invitation. If thou shalt ask, thou shalt receive revelation upon revelation, knowledge upon knowledge. What for? That thou mayest know the mysteries and peaceable things, that which bringeth joy, that which bringeth life eternal. That's a good point. What a, wonder, what a wonderful section here. And as we mentioned stewardships, maybe we can close when you look at the very end of, well, 91, just as a, a reminder again um, of a stewardship. If you're offended openly, rebuke openly. But if it's secret, do it in secret. Let's use appropriate means. And I can't help but think when we, we look at the section of what we're going through here, and it was a fast look, by the way. <laughs> um, I, I think that we, we come back to that notion of establishing a city of Zion. It really reflects back to us. How are we doing as inhabitants? Am I a good inhabitant? Would I be worthy of Zion? And then, and then we end the revelation with verse 93, and thus shall ye conduct in all things. What a wonderful guideline for those who would like to not only hear, but do, or in other words, be disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Th thank you for your help. Good to be here. Visit our website to find out more about the Doctrine and Covenants. Go to byubroadcasting.org. Funding for this program was provided in part by the Division of Continuing Education at Brigham Young University.